Perform hand hygiene before entering the patient's room. Introduce yourself and ask for your patient's full name and date of birth. If in a hospital setting, verify the accuracy of the name and date of birth with the patient's ID bracelet. If in a clinic setting, make sure the full name and date of birth the patient gives you matches previous documentation. Explain to the patient the assessment you will perform. In this case, I'll explain to my patient that I'm here to perform a full musculoskeletal assessment. I'll tell them that I will be asking them to perform different movements as well as testing their muscle strength. Always let your patient know that they have the right to refuse at any point and ask for their consent to continue. Make sure you have gathered all the relevant information needed before starting any physical assessment. In this case, I would have already done either a full health history or focused MSK history as well as performed a PQRST IUA. All physical assessments need to be done directly on the skin, whether you are inspecting or palpating. For the purposes of this video, some assessments may be done over clothes. Depending on your patient's condition, some tests may not be possible. Always make sure your patient is comfortable. First, we will start by going through the names of the different types of movements that skeletal muscle can produce. Flexion is the bending of a limb at a joint. Extension is the straightening of a limb at a joint. Abduction is moving a limb away from the midline of the body. Think abduct means to take away, so you are moving away. Adduction is moving a limb towards the midline of the body. Think add, you are bringing together. Circumduction is moving the arm in a circle around the shoulder. Rotation is moving the head around a central axis. Pronation is turning the forearm so the palm is down. Supination is the turning of the forearm so the palm is up. Inversion is moving the sole of the foot inward at the ankle. Eversion is moving the sole of the foot outwards at the ankle. Elevation is the raising of a body part. Depression is the lowering of a body part. Due to COVID-19 safety guidelines, the following will not be shown, but protraction is moving a body part forward and parallel to the ground, such as moving your jaw forward. Retraction is moving a body part backwards and parallel to the ground, such as retracting your jaw back to its neutral position. For the purposes of this video, we will only inspect and palpate the elbow joint. Always make sure to note the following for all joints assessed. Ensure to inspect the size and contour of the joint in its different positions. For the elbow, we will examine in the extended and flex position. Note the skin color, any deformity, redness, or swelling. Palpate with the patient's elbow flexed about 70 degrees and in a relaxed position. I will use my left hand to support the patient's left forearm. I will then palpate the extensor surface of the elbow, the alacrinone process, the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus with my right thumb and fingers. Then I will slide my thumb and fingers in the lateral groove and medial groove and palpate either side of the alacrinone process using varying pressure. I will make sure that fat pads are well felt at the alacrinone process and will palpate for any abnormalities such as synovial thickening, swelling, nodules, or tenderness. I am palpating the area of the alacrinone bursa for heat, swelling, tenderness, consistency, or nodules. I am currently performing the same palpation that I previously did on the left arm, but now doing it on the right arm. Afterwards, we will also ensure to test range of motion and muscle strength. Now 
The easiest way to test range of motion is to model as many of the movements yourself so your patient can copy you. It is important to be familiar with the approximate angles a joint should be able to move. Limited range of motion is the most sensitive sign of joint disease. Crepitation may be heard and felt when the joints are rough, such as with rheumatoid arthritis. When testing range of motion, it is also important to test muscle strength of prime muscle groups. Muscle strength is graded on a scale of 0 to 5. Our optimal score is a grade of 5. This means the person has full range of motion against gravity with full resistance. The patient is able to move that muscle independently, as well as oppose the resistance the examiner is applying. A grade of four is full range of motion against gravity with some resistance. The patient is able to move that muscle independently as well as somewhat oppose the resistance the examiner is applying. A grade of three means the patient has full range of motion with gravity. They can move that muscle completely independently but cannot oppose any resistance. A grade of two means full range of motion without gravity. This person cannot move that muscle on their own. They need your help to move but are able to complete the full range of motion. This is known as passive motion. A grade of one means there is only slight contraction of the muscle with the examiner's help. And finally, a grade of zero means no contraction is possible. Due to COVID safety guidelines, the temporomandibular assessment will be performed on a mannequin. Palpate the temporomandibular joint, located just in front of the tragus of the ear. As the patient moves their jaw, feel for any crepitus and ask if they have any tenderness. A clicking sound can be normal as the mouth opens. Ask the patient to clench their jaw, palpate the temporalis and masseter muscle for size and firmness. Ask the patient to open their mouth. The vertical distance of their open mouth should be between 3 to 6 centimeters. Have them protrude and then retract their jaw. There should be no deviation. With the mouth partially open, ask them to move their jaw laterally to each side. It should move 1 to 2 centimeters. You can also ask the patient to do these movements against resistance. For the purposes of this video, we will be testing muscle strength of only one movement of each joint. A point to remember, prior to assessing angles and range of motion, you will need to start with the joint at a relaxed, neutral position of zero degrees, which is your starting point. Afterwards, estimate the difference in angle from your start point to the end point the patient is able to move to. Now, let's assess the neck. Flexion of the neck is 45 degrees. Lateral bending on either side is 40 degrees. Rotation to either side is 70 degrees. Hyperextension of the neck is 55 degrees. My patient had a grade five muscle strength for all neck movements. Moving on to the shoulders. Forward flexion is 180 degrees. Hyperextension can be up to 50 degrees. Abduction is 180 degrees. Adduction is 50 degrees. All shoulder muscles were grade a 5. Internal and external rotation is difficult to visualize. The angle should be 90 degrees for both internal and external rotation. For internal rotation, the patient should be able to have both backs of their hands touching their lower back. For external rotation, the patient should be able to have both palms of the hands touching behind their head. For the elbow, flexion should be between 150 to 160 degrees. Some people may have 5 to 10 degrees less in the extension position and others may have 5 to 10 degrees of hyperextension. To test muscle strength, stabilize the arm with one hand while applying resistance with the other. My patient's extension and flexion are a grade of 5. 
pronation and supination angles are 90 degrees. Moving on to the hands and wrists. With the hand straight out, ask your patient to bend up at the wrist. Hyperextension is 70 degrees. Palmer flexion is 90 degrees. Again with the hand straight out, have your patient bend only their fingers up and down. Flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints should be 90 degrees and hyperextension should be 30 degrees. With palms flat on a table, ask your patient to move only their hand. Moving towards the little finger, ulnar deviation should be between 50 to 60 degrees. Moving towards the thumb, radial deviation is 20 degrees. Spreading or abducting the fingers apart should create 20 degree angles. To see the speed and ease of response of your patient, tell them to abduct their fingers and then clench and make a fist. Response should be equal bilaterally. Also, ask them to touch their thumb to the base of their little finger. Again, responses should be equal bilaterally. To test muscle strength, have the person's forearm supinated on a table. Stabilize their arm by holding your hand on their mid forearm. Ask them to flex their wrist against your resistance. My patient's hand and wrist strength are grade 5. Next, we will assess the knee. Having the person standing in their regular stance should be an extension of 0 degrees. In some people, a hyperextension of up to 15 degrees may be present. With the patient standing, ask them to flex the knee. Flexion should be between 130 to 150 degrees. Test muscle strength by trying to pull the leg forward as the patient remains flexed. My patient has a grade 5. My patient is able to move from a low seated position to a standing position, which demonstrates their extension muscle strength. Next, let's move on to the ankle and foot. Ask your patient to flex their toes towards their nose. Dorsiflexion is 20 degrees. Ask them to then flex their toes towards the floor. Plantar flexion is 45 degrees. My patient's muscle strength for each type of flexion is grade 5. Next, moving only at the ankle, ask your patient to turn the soles of their feet inwards. Inversion should be 30 degrees. Eversion should be 20 degrees. Next, we will assess the hips. Have your patient supine. Always test one side at a time. With the leg completely straight, ask your patient to flex up the hip. Flexion should be 90 degrees. Then have your patient bring the knee to the chest. Hip flexion with the knee bent should be 120 degrees. With the knee and hip starting off flexed, stabilize your patient by having one hand on their thigh and the other on their ankle. External rotation at the hip should be 45 degrees. Internal rotation should be 40 degrees. Abduction is between 40 to 45 degrees. Adduction is between 20 to 30 degrees. My patient's muscle strength at the hips is a grade of 5. With the patient standing, stabilize their hips and have them hyperextend. The angle should be 15 degrees. Next, we will assess the spine. With the patient's back exposed, you can inspect that the spine is straight. When inspecting from the side, the thoracic curve should be convex and the lumbar curve should be concave. Ask the patient to bend forwards to try and touch their toes. This flexion should be between 75 to 90 degrees. For these next movements, you can stabilize the patient's pelvis. Ask the patient to bend laterally to each side. The angle should be 35 degrees. Ask the person to lean back. Hyperextension should be up to 30 degrees. Ask them to rotate to each side, only moving the upper body. Rotation should be 30 degrees bilaterally. 
To test muscle strength, have the patient walk on their toes and then walk on their heels. Next, I will be performing the Fallon test. Ask your patient to hold both hands back to back while flexing the wrists 90 degrees. They need to hold this acute flexion of the wrist for 60 seconds. This will result in no symptoms in the normal hand. The Fallon test produces numbness and burning in a person with carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by interference with motor function as a result of compression of the median nerve inside the carpal tunnel. Now I will be assessing for the tunnel sign. I will begin by percussing directly over the location of the median nerve at the wrist. This produces no symptoms in the normal hand. In carpal tunnel syndrome, percussion of the median nerve produces burning and tingling along its distribution, which is a positive tinnel sign. Test bulge sign in the suprapatellar pouch. I will start by firmly stroking up on the medial aspect of the knee two or three times to displace any fluid. Then tap the lateral aspect. Watch the medial side in the hollow area for a distinct bulge from a fluid wave. Normally, none is present. Bulge sign confirms the presence of small amounts of fluid, approximately four to eight milliliters, as fluid moves from one side of the joint to the other. Next, I will perform the allotment of the patella. I will use one hand to compress the super patellar pouch to move any fluid into the knee joint. With my other hand, I will push the patella sharply against the femur. If no fluid is present, the patella is already snug against the femur. This is only a reliable assessment when larger amounts of fluid are present. If your patient has a history of trauma followed by locking, giving way, or local pain to the knee, this is an indication to perform the McMurray test. Position your patient in a supine position and stand on the affected side. Hold the heel and flex the knee and hip. Place your other hand on the knee with fingers on the medial side. Rotate leg in and out to loosen the joint. Externally rotate the leg and push inwards, applying stress on the knee. Slowly extend the leg. Normally, the leg extends smoothly with no pain. A clicking sound is a positive result of the McMurray test that signifies a torn meniscus. If it's your first time getting your patient out of bed, it is vital to perform a proper musculoskeletal assessment of the upper and lower extremities to ensure safety. At the end of your assessment, ask your patient if they have any questions. Ensure they are comfortable and have the call bell in place if in a hospital setting. Also make sure to bring the bed back to the lowest position. If in a hospital setting, you may put the bed rails back up as well if your patient requires it. Remember to perform hand hygiene after you've completed your assessment.